Okay, so when you boil it down, all that the IPCC has left, all that Professor Stefan has left, is the computer models, the so-called GCMs for Global Circulation Models. Let's have a quick look at them. This is a summary diagram from the IPCC's last report. It shows temperature from 1900 to 2000 plotted in black. These are the thermometer records. The scale is expanded up, which squashes the record down. Here's the warming up to 1940, the cooling down to 1979, and here's the warming in the late 20th century that we're supposed to be so worried about. Then on top of that, in purple, this is the field of projections of the IPCC's 23 computer models. And it's big variation. And you see that they're projecting, in 100 years' time, anything between 4 degrees of warming and about 2 degrees of warming. <coughs> so that's the projection, which is a warming rate of 0.2 degrees per decade through the, the next 100 years. That's their projection. Here's what actually happened to temperature at the moment this graph was made. Temperature's going down. <laughs> Here are the error bars dotted. And you will see that the projections are wrong. Now, this is the only thing left to the government and its advisers to argue, to convince you people, and I will never forgive you if you let them convince you, that there needs to be a carbon dioxide. They all say, but these models, they're so clever, they're so sophisticated, they're written by such intellectually powerful people, all of which is true, but they are PlayStation or Xbox games, and that's what scientists do. I don't say that to put them down. Games playing is really important in science. It's heuristic. You, you discover. It, you, it serves to learn and to discover. So I'm all for the modelling, but you must never, ever treat it as predictive because we know it's not predictive. We know it's wrong, and I've shown you on that slide. Well, I'm not the only person that knows it's wrong. The main modeller in Australia, and one of the 23 modellers for the IPCC, of course, is CSIRO. Inside the front of every modelling report, they have this. This report relates to climate change scenarios Based on computer modelling, models involve simplifications of the real processes that are not fully under... Well, whoever would have thought that? <laughs> Goodness gracious me. Accordingly, no responsibility will be accepted by CSIRO or the Queensland Government for the accuracy of forecasts or predictions of firms or any person... <laughs> There's another sort of models, and they're called statistical models. This is a 60-year cycle, but like the 1,000-year one, it's probably driven by solar fluctuation. Whatever it's driven by, it's there. So if you fit this mathematical curve, a simple sine curve, in fact, through the data, at this point, you can project the curve on, which is what has been done. And what you see is, the projection is that we will be cooling for the next two to three decades. So whereas the GCMs are known to be wrong, and note again, this is not Bob Carter's opinion, this is demonstrated in the scientific literature. They are wrong. We equally know that these statistical models, at least in so far as they've been tested, because this one was first run at about this point in 1998, and it said temperature is going to go down, and it did. So this one, so far as it's been tested, is on track. So the statistical climate models, which you've never heard about, are equally scientifically valid as a scientific technique to use. There's about five or six different major uh, papers done on this, and five out of the six project cooling for the next two or three decades. Well, I think you'll agree that what I've said, lots of you not only had a suspicion that this was going on, but uh, you, you know almost as much about it as I do. But for a lot of you, this is coming as a bit of a surprise. And now is the real question. How did we get to here? Because we are in an incredible situation where we've got a policy, global warming policy, which has helped to topple one Prime Minister, John Howard, helped to elect another, Kevin Rudd, has toppled two successive leaders of the opposition, Brendan Nelson and uh, Malcolm Turnbull. So two Prime Ministers, three opposition leaders, and another Prime Minister struggling to survive at the moment, is the current tally of scalps. Here's how we got there. This is an ABC website. And it's a calculator. You can see from the graphics it's designed to attract the children in the 6 to 10 or so age range. Um, and you can work out uh, what your greenhouse is. How big a greenhouse pig are you? 
So you work your way across clicking and answering all this and you get to this one and you click on the skull and crossbow. And the screen erupts in a fountain of blood and a seven-year-old girl is told she will use her share of the planet's resources in 9.3 years. <laughs> the ABC received hundreds of letters of complaint from all over the world. Now, this is symptomatic. I could show you slides and give you a whole talk, starting at kindergarten, going through to this primary school, going through to secondary school, and going through to university, and even in the workforce, where young people are indoctrinated with this outrageous propaganda. There is not an Australian, young Australian person under the age of 35 years who has had an education in environmental science. They have all had an indoctrination. And that's how we've got partly to where we're getting today. Here's the second part. This is a think tank in London, Institute for Public Policy Research. A few years ago, they released a report, Warm Words, How Are We Telling the Climate Story and Can We Tell It Better? Well, that's sort of suspicious. That, that sort of flags it, doesn't it? You think there's something funny about that. Strange title. Well, here's a section from it. The task of climate change agencies, that's the Greenhouse Office or the Department of Climate Change, is not to persuade by ra oh, rational argument. How old-fashioned. How could anybody want to do that? Goodness gracious me. Instead, we need to work in a more shrewd and contemporary way, well, using subtle techniques of engagement. The facts need to be treated as so taken for granted they need not be spoken. Like global warming is still happening, isn't it, chaps? Of course it isn't. It's cooling. It gets worse. Ultimately, positive climate behaviours. That's the problem with you lot. You need to shake yourselves up and you need to get some positive climate behaviour need to be approached in the same way as marketeers approach acts of buying and consuming. It amounts to treating climate-friendly activity as a brand that can be sold. This is, we believe, the route to mass behaviour change. I seem to remember some people using words like that in the 20th century. Remember that? That's why we're at where we're at today. Who cares? Just a little tin pot London think tank, and in this context I can say it's left wing too, so who on earth would listen to them? Well, the answer is the people that were listening to them were Prime Minister Tony Blair and his spinmeister Alistair Campbell. And this describes exactly the policy that Tony Blair ruthlessly followed for the last six years of his Prime Ministership. It was spread to countries like Australia, New Zealand and Canada by equally ruthless use of the diplomatic services and an organisation which in many other ways is a good organisation called the British Council. But Britain has used every diplomatic tool at its disposal to try and spread this worldwide. So I said the last part of my talk will be, where do we go from here? What, surely, what can we do? We need to do something constructive. It's no good just being against the government in this case or against the bad science. We have to have a way forward. And before I answer that, I need to alert you to one other piece of context about the science, and it's this. This now is a graph of the last 25,000 years. And the blue curve is Antarctic temperatures, and the red curve is Greenland temperatures, and the data come from ice cores. It's very beautiful scientific work. And what you see is in what's called the last great glaciation, temperatures jogging along, varying half a degree or so, but very cold both places. Then over 10,000 years it warms up to the start of what geologists call the Holocene. That's the modern warm period that we live in. It's the modern interglacial time and it's lasted for 10,000 years. So that's fine. That's the record. And you see there's commonalities between Antarctica and Greenland. But you see that there's something going on in Greenland here that didn't happen in Antarctica. And it's this warming up to almost interglacial cooling down to glacial again and then warming back up all in a couple of thousand years. Now this is called the YD, the Younger Dryas episode because this little plant here is a Dryas and its pollen are scattered around in lake muds which scientists have taken cores out of to establish this climatic record in the first place. So the Younger Dryas then was a period of intense cold, renewed glaciation during the warming 
that went from the main glaciation to the modern warm period. And the obvious question is, how fast did these changes take place? And a paper just published last year in what used to be one of the world's premier journals, Nature, showed the remarkable result that that warming took place in three years. This warming took place in 60 years, six decades. So is this a weather event or a climate event? And the answer is there is no difference between <laughs> weather and climate. That's a, a statistical convenience that scientists impose on nature. Nature couldn't care less about that. Nature sees a spectrum of processes operating on all time scales, and these are both weather and climate events. The key point is a dramatic change like that can happen in just three years with no warning. Now, just before we leave this, but in passing, there's that reporter again down the back saying, Bob, is it warming or is it cooling at the moment? Well, madam, it's cooling. Here we are, last 10,000 years in Greenland and Antarctica, it's cooling. And the late 20th century warming, let's go back to context again, that we're, well, we're not worried about, but Julia Gillard and her advisor worry about, is this little tick in here? Are they serious? Okay, so what did the younger dryers do? Well, Here's the red spot there in the middle of Greenland is the point from which the ice core was taken that that record came from. And what we see here is at the end of winter in 2004, March in the Northern Hemisphere, end of winter, here is the front of the sea ice across the Arctic Ocean. Here's a reconstruction for younger driest winters 12,000 years ago. Here is the sea ice front and as you will see there wasn't much shipping coming out of the ports of Southampton and Rotterdam. <laughs> this could happen tomorrow. You can grow sea ice in a matter of a year or two. You can't grow an ice cap, but you can grow sea ice. I don't know a single government of countries around the North Atlantic Ocean that have this on their radar. Why? Because they're all absolutely besotted we're dealing with this problem of possible dangerous warming caused by human carbon dioxide. It's absolutely astonishing, this neglect of the true climatic risk. And that's one of the real dangers of this fad uh, about global warming, is that it's making politicians completely ignore the much bigger real risks of natural environmental change.